Praise the Lord. Let's rise up as we pray together. Father, we thank you for a leadership development meeting tonight. We're asking, Lord, that your word will reach us, touch us, turn us around, transform our lives. Lord, we pray you help us to remember what we are forgetting. And then when we get to our various homes and offices and places of work and in our community, that all the words we're hearing, everything we're learning, you help us to remember and put to practice in Jesus' name. Grace in church will also manifest as grace in our community. And the love in the church will manifest as love in our community in Jesus' name. That we're children of God, the characteristics of the children of God we manifest in church, we receive in church. When we go out there to the marketplace, anywhere we find ourselves, we will live by that same grace and the teaching you are giving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, not to play the chameleon. One thing in church and one thing outside. One thing in the private and another thing in the public. One thing in our profession, another thing in our lifestyle. We pray, Lord, that your grace will always be in our heart, in our life, anywhere, everywhere, in Jesus' name. As we have promised that you will never leave us, we also, Lord, we promise that you have saved us will never leave you too. Amen. Let your grace abound in every life. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can sit down. As you know, today we have looked at a certain scripture a subject. And we look at the chapter. It's Matthew chapter 18 from verse 1 all through to verse 35. We'll be touching on some of those verses today. We're looking at Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 15. It says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou as gained thy brother. Understand, this is personal offense between a child of God and another child of God. It's telling us how to act, how to resolve, how to manage things when a brother offends us. It's not talking about church discipline here. It's not talking about if a brother offends in the church in general. It's not talking about society. If a person offends in general in society, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, a wife to the husband, a husband to the wife, a member of the church to another member of the church and a member of the church to the leader in the church personal offense not church offense not doctrinal offense not ministerial offense personal offense if your brother shall trespass against you go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, if he says, so I'm sorry about that, how could I be that careless? I am sorry, personal offense, then it's over. And it says, thou hast gained thy brother. The fellowship is restored. The understanding, the relationship is restored. And then in verse 16, it says, but if he will not hear thee. Personal offense? I don't understand that. How could you pick an offense from that? I don't understand this thing you are saying, that I have offended you. It says, A, 
your wife, your husband, your brother, your sister, your neighbor, in a personal way. If he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more. That in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. If he says, I don't understand how that is an offense. If it's your wife, don't go to her mother and don't go to your own mother. If it's your husband, don't go to the in-laws and don't go to other people. Stay within the confine of the fellowship of the believers that you will call a brother, a sister, one or two, and they look at it, you state the case. I felt offended and here is the reason for the offense then the other the people who are there will say oh, brother can't you see this this is obvious this is an offense you shouldn't have done this what if he had done this to you and he shakes his head and he says i don't understand still then he tells you the next step and the next thing you are to do in verse 17 it says in verse 17 and if he shall neglect to hear them it says tell each to the church now i cannot come sunday morning in the church so and so has offended me a private problem a personal problem and uh, why they say if you have any question to ask now you can stand up now and ask your question and then uh, you take the microphone you say tell each to the church i have a problem i have a challenge brother so and so james has done this to me and i try to follow the precepts of christ and uh, he will not hear. I even took so and so and such and such. And they looked at it. And the thing is a pain on my side. And it's a thorn in my neck. Now, as you give us chance to ask questions, I'm now reporting to the church. That's not what he's saying. We have leaders in the church. We have pastors in the church. There's a local pastor there. There's a district pastor there, and there is a good pastor there, and there is the senior pastor overall uh, over at uh, the church with all the districts, and we will take the case to, that's what he's saying, tell the representative of the church, tell it unto the church, but if he neglect to hear him, if he neglects to hear the church, let him. Now, you're, going to, you're not going to have bitterness in your heart. You're not going to carry all that all through your life. And then you are stopped and you cannot move forward anymore in your Christian life. Let him be unto thee as an heathen. It's not a close friend. It's not a person you can share your heart with. He doesn't have understanding he doesn't have the grace of god to be or to remain a believer is now a heathen man or a publican what do i do to a heathen a publican and a public and a publican i give him water if he needs water if he's thirsty I give him food if I have the food and he's hungry. I still help him as a heathen and a publican. I still present the gospel unto him. And I'm still going to evangelize him. I'm still going to be talking to him, not about the matter between him and myself, between him and I. All I'm talking about now, I'm talking to the heathen. He needs salvation he needs conversion he needs the grace of god in his life that's what jesus meant when he said now you're taking all the steps and he's not listening he'll be a heathen christ counts him a heathen god counts him as a heathen heaven counts him as a heathen you are afraid 
for him. Not afraid of him. You are afraid for him. If he dies in that condition, heaven, God, Christ, angels, and the believers count him a key then, and a publican. And so because you are afraid of where he will spend eternity, you still give him the message of the gospel, the message of repentance, and the message of coming into the kingdom of God so that he can be saved. The topic tonight is forgiveness in the fellowship of the Father's family. Here is the family of the Father. Those who are brothers and sisters, those who are born again, they are children of God. They belong to the Father's family. And we have fellowship. We're supposed to be in fellowship, heart-to-heart -heart fellowship, life instructing and life interacting fellowship. And then somebody might step on your toe. Somebody might say something he shouldn't have said. Somebody might have acted in a way that you are offended. But hold on, hold on. Don't get offended at everything. You are a believer too. And as a believer, you don't have, you know, offense every time. And wearing your feeling on your skin. As a believer, we come to a place of maturity because if we don't come to a place of maturity, every little sin will count as offense. You, you can't live like that, husband and wife. Every little sin, I'm offended, I'm offended. Every little sin, that doesn't go well with me. You must be mature yourself too, that you do not count every little action every little word, every little behavior, and everything that everybody does as an offense. But even with the maturity, if you are offended, there is a way to handle that. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, forgiveness of personal offenses among the brethren. Forgiveness of personal offenses among the brethren. Number two, the fullness of powerful overcomers in all battles. The fullness of powerful overcomers in all battles. Number three, the forfeiture of precious opportunities through bitterness. Bitterness. When you are pregnant of bitterness, and you go through all the pains of pregnancy for bitterness. And eventually, it's a kind of pregnancy that people never deliver. Nine months have gone, they're still pregnant. One year, three years, seven years have gone, they're still pregnant of the bitterness. And every time, they're still vomiting every time they're still having the fever of the pregnancy of bitterness and they don't enjoy life in the day and in the night that pregnancy of bitterness is turning and turning over there they don't enjoy their food they don't enjoy the air they don't enjoy the climate they don't enjoy the church they don't enjoy the grace of god they enjoy nothing because of the pregnancy of bitterness who are you how are you? How does your life go? Are you carrying the bitterness around? Why don't you allow the Lord to make you deliver that and get rid of that? Then your life will become better in Jesus' name. My life will come better in Jesus' name. A child of God that has the grace of God the love of God, and there is no iota or bitterness in him towards anybody on the face of the earth. The grace of God flowing, the grace of God increasing, and the love of God manifested every time you sleep with no bitterness. 
you will sleep well. You wake up and there's no bitterness to any man, any woman on earth. You will live well in Jesus' name. You get to your office and you look everybody at everybody eyeball to eyeball. And, and there is no bitterness. There's no regret. And there is nothing negative oozing out in your life. Your life will be beautiful. And then when you are to pass from here to yonder place, and you know, the final day has come. And the Lord is going to take you from here to there. Your heart, your mind, your feeling, no bitterness. Everything is all right. You will know that the gate and the door of heaven is opened unto you. Your life was free here. And when you cross over, you go into the eternal fellowship of God and the people of God in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at number one here. Number one, forgiveness of personal offenses among the brethren. I've read the verses already, uh, verses 15 to 17. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, the indispensable forgiveness at the new birth. Number two, the initiated forgiveness of offending brethren. Number three, the insufficient forgiveness of obstinate backsliders. Let's look at number one there. Number one, the, in, the indispensable forgiveness at the new birth, uh, look at uh, Matthew chapter 18, uh, reading from verse 3. And said, this is Jesus talking, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, stop them, Except ye be converted, All men on earth need conversion. All women on earth need conversion. All boys and girls, every body here on earth if he wants to get to the kingdom of god we need conversion now you can be forgiven by your husband that's not conversion that's good that's good for the marriage that's not enough for heaven you can be forgiven by your wife you blew it and you did the unthinkable and your wife says no divorce no separation i forgive you that's not salvation is the forgiveness in your nuclear local little family there but to get to heaven except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven if you have committed an offense that offense is against god and also against man on earth the people on earth may forgive you the government may forgive you they may cancel the imprisonment that they should have given you good so far but that's not far enough you need the forgiveness of god you need the salvation of god that is indispensable because christ said except ye be converted except ye be forgiven by heaven except your life by grace turns around except ye be converted and become as little children ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven it tells us in verse 4 it says in verse 4 whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child this little child cannot show that characteristic until that child is born and you cannot show that characteristic of child likeness until you are born 
into the kingdom. If you are not yet born into the kingdom, the humility will be superficial. The humility will be artificial. The humility will be make-believe. The humility will be hypocritical. But when you are born again and the grace of God comes into your life, then you are able in a genuine way you are able in a regenerational way you're regenerated and your life takes on a new stage and status and you are able to humble yourself to the expectation of christ as this little child except that happens you cannot even enter into the kingdom and then if you do that after you are born again, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Did I hear an amen there? Yeah. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 30. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Look at verse 30. 31, him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. Look at this. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. To give repentance and forgiveness of sins. Do you remember? As Christ was going to the cross, and Pilate told them, those Israelites, and he said, I don't find any fault in this man, the king of the Jews. They said, don't worry about that. Let his blood be upon us and our children. And then you remember Christ crucified on the cross. And Christ said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That forgiveness did not take the Israelites to heaven. They personally must now understand we need to be born into the kingdom. All those Pharisees, all those Sadducees that Jesus said, forgive them. That was his love. That was says, the grace in him. The same thing with us when you offend a brother. He asks love. He said, Father, forgive him. When you offend a sister, she has grace. Father, forgive him or her. That forgiveness says something about the brother. It's a child of God, real child of God. But it doesn't say anything about you yet until you have repentance from God and you have forgiveness that comes from God. The children of Israel had reared up an idol and Moses came from the mountain and Moses saw what they had done and Joshua said, these people are rejoicing because they overcame in a battle. He said, it's not the voice or the sound or the singing or the dancing of the people that overcame. This looked like people who are having festivities. And God told Moses, he said, the people that you brought from the land of Egypt, they are backsliding and they have gone to rear up, raise up an idol. And Moses saw them. They have gone into idol worship. And Moses broke the tables of stone because they had broken what was written on that stone before he even came. And Moses went to God and said, God, please 
forgiven in the heart of Moses, they had forgiveness. That doesn't say anything about Aaron or the children of Israel. It says something about Moses and his maturity and the grace and the love in him. Then he said, if you will not forgive them, blot out my name out of the book which you are written. That's forgiveness. Moses had forgiveness for them. But God said, Moses, I cannot blot out your name out of the book that I've written. He who has sinned against me, him, will I blot out his name from the book that I've written. Even though Moses forgave them, they still must have the forgiveness of God. And you know, out of the 600,000 people, Moses forgave them, forgave them, forgave them, brought water out of the rock for them, and the manna was flowing. All those physical things were there, but only two of those people, Caleb and Joshua, God to the land of promise. Before we can get to that land of promise, it's not enough that the person you offended, the person she offended, the person he offended, that he forgives. Yes, we have to forgive. We must forgive. That is our responsibility. But if you don't get forgiveness from God and you are not born again and you are not saved and you do not become a new creature in Christ, that human forgiveness will not carry you far, will not carry you to heaven. It says him, Christ, as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance. He prayed on the cross, forgive them. They needed to repent. And Christ was now going to give them repentance. And after that repentance, forgiveness of sins. I come to number two here. Number two, we're looking at the initiated forgiveness of offending brothers initiated what does that mean an offense has taken place and the man that offended you is walking up and down is smiling and no problem and it's like he doesn't have a conscience that registers the pain of offense is still carrying on his life it's like her husband is cheating on the wife and the wife knows and the wife is crying and and the Christ is weeping privately and, and and the man you know doesn't have any feeling any pain of offending anybody is the food ready have you prepared those my clothes and the woman is suffering and aching on the inside and the fellow has uh, no thought about what he has done now you offended brother offended sister you have to take initiative the man doesn't think he has done anything wrong the woman doesn't think she's done anything wrong the brother there the sister there doesn't feel that he's done anything wrong take initiative to take initiative means it's not talking about it i must talk about it but i don't have the courage to talk to the man well you have to choose that inner suffering that you have you're dying on the inside because of that offense and then the courage to stand up to him and stand up to her and come you might have to pray before before you do that you might have to look at the word of god on the strength of character the courage he gives you but you must take initiative look at matthew now chapter 18 reading from verse 15 moreover if thy brother if thy neighbor, if thy sister, if thy wife, if thy husband shall trespass against thee. Against thee. Uh, we're not talking of, you know, something we should just overlook. There are things that happen in life, you know, on the street. 
you just overlook a taxi is carrying you and then instead of you know taking you directly there it's brought other people there it branches there and there there are things which you just overlook we come to the church and i like to sit there and the usher says i should go and sit there that's all right there are things we should overlook but there is an offense that is really painful you cannot shake it off and your maturity, your prayer, your thought, and your thoughtfulness cannot shake it off. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Take the initiative and go to him. Don't take any other person. Go to him. Let there be enough privacy. A man to a woman, we're not talking of privacy that, you know, the man could rough handle you and defile you, not that kind of privacy. It might be in the church, it might be outside there. Please, brother, please, sister, before you go from the service, I'd like to see you. I'd like to, you know, discuss something personal, something very important. And so, between you and him alone, tell him his fault. If he shall hear thee, if he pays attention, while you are talking to him, he's not looking here and there. He's actually attentive. And after you finish, he said, my sister, I'm so sorry. I want to accept. I was careless. I was thoughtless. I didn't think that if another person had done that to me, I too would have taken offense. Please forgive me. It settles there. Don't say you are not sincere. Don't say I don't believe that. Don't say I don't accept that apology. Right there and then if he shall hear thee thou hast gained thy brother the fellowship is back the understanding is back the sharing is back you will act to him to her as if he or she never offended you look at verse 16 in verse 16 but if he will not hear thee so that, that's what you called me for you think i don't have any other important thing to do after the service wait for me i wanted to tell you something that, that's what you wanted to say i even thought you wanted to say something reasonable and something that's important you're telling me that i offended you that's an offense you have not seen anything and the thing pains you more you're almost blaming yourself what did I call him? What did I call her? What did I tell her? What did it I just swallow? That bitter pill. Because now he is giving me, she's giving me a more bitter pill to swallow. No, don't regret. You're, you're obeying Christ. In our obedience to Christ, if our neighbor, our brother, our wife, our husband, our, our brother, our sister, if he does not understand us we're not going to regret that you obeyed christ it says but if he will not hear thee then take with thee one or two more don't stop at least for the sake of his soul and for the sake of your own peace it says take more one or two that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established so you take two people who are not partial you take people who will not take sides you take people who are matured with understanding you take people who will not go gossiping my wife, I'm sorry I delayed you, you know. I just, uh, so-and-so called me, and they had a reach between them. And then you begin to expose everything that you have heard. Not such people, people who are matured, people who are righteous, and people who are godly. They're not gossiping people. And it says, 
he has not accepted. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Now, he doesn't say that brother is a worker in the church, is a leader in the church. He offended me. That sister is a worker, a leader in the church. She offended me. That sister is very close to the leadership. And she offended me. That brother is very close. He's the one the pastor is always calling. Go pick that. Go do that. Go rectify that. Go correct that. Very close to leadership. And he offended me. Trampled on me. And I've called to other people. All right. Bye-bye church. I'll leave the church. Because they offended me, and they, they even cut me like rag to, to kind of mop the floor. I will leave the church. No, he didn't say leave the church. Uh, when we're following Christ, we follow him through, all the way through. It says, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. Now, sometimes some very important almost indispensable people in the church because of their position because of their activity they've forgotten heaven and you call them maybe to do something in your house and you pay them the full price what they dictated what they said they wanted to have and when you look at what they said they have done it's even worse in a worse condition than the time before you call them now how can this brother do this and then you tell him this is that's the best i can do you knew me before you called me i'm an expert in this area of work Nobody else complains. And you are the only one complaining. You bring other people, please. See the amount of money I paid this brother. And look at what he has done. The place that was leaking is still leaking. And even there is a greater damage done in my house. And he calls two people. Two people who are knowledgeable in that area of work. Two people who are experts too in that area of work and they're real children of God. Please help me look at this. Talk to this brother. You are in the same uh, profession. And they talked to him. He said, what I will do is what I have done. I'm not at fault. Anywhere he wants to go, he wants to go to the pastor, let him go to the pastor. And so because he has not heard, you talk to the church to the pastor and he says pastor this is my area of expertise i have done everything i should do it's like you wasted money you offended of course you trusted him but he proves himself untrustable it says when you tell it to the church but if you neglect to hear the church, don't take him to the court. Don't say, I know how they settle this over the radio. I know the people that they, they will dig to the matter until the root. And I will not, I, I, I will take him. He thinks it's wise, I'll catch him. I might even make him lose his license for his profession. He says, don't do that. Leave him in the hands of God. Continue your life. What have you lost? What have you lost? Other people have lost greater. And it says, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. What am I to do? Then we come to church and I see him. He's coming this way. I close my eyes. I look away. Uh -uh. As a heathen, as a publican, you'll greet him. You'll say, 
good morning. Welcome to the service. You'll be cheerful to him. That's what we do to our neighbors and to the publicans and to the heathens. We do not bear grudge in our heart. We keep on relating like we relate with everybody that we meet on the way. We relate with everybody that we see in the office. But it's now a heathen, a publican to you to the church, to God, and to Christ. And you are praying for his salvation. I pray such people will be saved. They will repent in Jesus' name. Uh, let's come to number three here. Number three, the insufficient forgiveness of obstinate backsliders. Insufficient forgiveness of obstinate backsliders. Look at that, uh, Matthew chapter 18, the last part, verse 17, the last part there. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee, unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Here comes David. And David, the innocent boy, he's done every good thing he could do for the nation. And Saul took 3,000 soldiers chasing young David. And David had the chance because he saw him there lying down. And one of his armor bearers said, David, the Lord has brought this man to an end. You are the anointed one. Kill him. And then you take over the throne. If you are not bold enough to kill him, I'll do it for you. One stroke and he's gone. I said, no, you cannot do that. As terrible, as terrorizing, as evil as Saul was, David said, I forgive him. I leave him in the hands of God. But he took something as an evidence and went far away and said, my father, not my enemy, forgiveness. Forgiveness comes from the heart. And it is the stage of your heart out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. My father, my father, why is it? You left the throne and you're chasing over a fleece on a dog. Why? I was there and I saw that you were deep asleep and all the people around you were asleep. I could have killed you but no how could i kill the anointed of the lord i forgive you and saul said is that your voice my son you're more righteous than i if a man sees his enemy will he allow him to go like that you have spared my life and he said i know surely you were reign on the throne of Israel. And he says, please remember me. When you come to the throne, that will not wipe my whole family away. And David said, yes, my father, I forgive you. I'll do exactly that. And Saul went this way and David went another way. But in the heart of David, he has forgiven. That's a heathen man. And that is a pagan. And I'm not going to play any game of Saul. The chapter after that, the one I told you now, chapter 24. Chapter 26, Saul rose up again. And he said, where is he? I must kill him. 
in the case of David, he forgave. But in the case of Saul, he was still after him, after him, after him. That's what the Lord is telling us. Forgive. Overlook it. But the forgiveness that David gave was not sufficient to take Saul to heaven. You must still have the forgiveness of God that comes with a change of heart. You must still have the forgiveness from God that comes with conversion, with salvation, with a turning around. Eventually, not too far from chapter 26, chapter 28, as is nature unconverted nature not born again totally backsliding he went to the witch doctor and god will not listen to him and eventually still a few chapters after that he died unconverted in his iniquity the forgiveness that david gave did not take him to heaven you must have forgiveness from God, conversion by the Lord. But in the case of David, David said, after Jonathan and Saul had died, is there anyone in the house of Saul that I will show kindness to? He actually forgave. In the house of Saul and Jonathan. And he said, this one man is lame in the field. His name is Mephibosheth. He said, call him. I forgave Saul on my part. I forgave Jonathan. I forgave everyone. And now he told Mephibosheth, he said, you will eat at my table all the days of your life. We learn. We shall forgive. Whether the people change or not, that's between them and God. Whether the people get the forgiveness of God or not, whether they are saved or not, that's between them and God. But let the obstinate backslider know that the forgiveness we give as human beings is not enough to take them to heaven. You must have the forgiveness of the Lord. Ye must be born again. Except a man be born again of water and the Spirit, he can by no means get into heaven. I come to point number two. Point number two, the fullness of powerful overcomers in all battles we're dividing this to three parts number one number one is the binding power of unfettered believers number two the boundless possibilities of united brethren number three the benevolent pilgrim with unlimited brotherliness we're looking at number one there number one is the binding power of unfettered believers now if a believer himself is fettered he cannot manifest power you want to break yoke in another person's life you must not have yoke yourself you want to release other people you yourself must be unfettered and you must have had total freedom from the lord a person is not free from anger. He wants to set another person free from anger. A person is not free from bitterness. He wants to set another person free from bitterness. A person is not free from corruption and compromise. He wants to set other people free from corruption and compromise. You yourself must be unfettered. You're free. And all those things that limit people, you're free from them. Only then can you have the power of binding and loosing. It tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. 
your loss a good amen. amen. Somebody is coming from the house between him and the wife. It's very much bound with hatred. It's bound with the thoughts of separation and divorce. It's bound with the attitude of this woman, this woman. How did I come across this woman? And all the time is bound. And then he comes to the church and they see demon possessed people and uh, our leaders help us. Uh, they, they take him out and because they know that this fellow, he calls himself a member of the prayer warriors, and they say, this person is demonized, is bound by this spirit of demons. Come and cast him out, and then he stands, and he says, whatsoever I bind on earth is bound in heaven. And everyone looks at him, but you have bound yourself for the cord of hatred, or the cord of animosity, you are bound yourself, or the cord of jealousy, you are bound yourself, or the cord of suspicion, and there is no, you are bound your wife by your own utterance, you are bound your children by your own declaration when you bind the people at home with your language with your hatred and with your bitter attitude and then you want to come and lose somebody in the church my brother my sister charity begins at home losing binding begins at home your wife does not even have confidence in you that you can pray for her, anything could happen because it's always nagging, it's always fighting, it's always criticizing, it's always crucifying at home. And then when you come to church, praise the Lord, hallelujah, whatsoever we bind on us, lose that cord of hatred at home first, and then you have the liberty, you have the power. And when you're free, your soul, your spirit, your mind, your heart, your brain, your intelligence, you are unfettered. Calm. It will not take you long. Anything you say, God will confirm in heaven. That's why he says, verily, assuredly, I say unto you, I don't have any confidence in people. They're coming to church and they're going to preach. And all the time between the house and the church, they're arguing. They're arguing. All right, I want to preach. Let me, let me have settled thoughts on my message. When we get back home, I'm telling you, if I am the son of my father, if I am the offspring of my mother, I'm telling you, when we get back home, I will deal with you. You will never forget. But let me preach first. When I finish the preaching, you'll see what will happen. Such people cannot bind anything. They cannot lose anything. You'll be a loser in ministry. You'll not have the power. You'll not have the authority. You'll not have the recognition of heaven. It is when you're unfettered yourself. No anger, no bitterness, no confrontation, and there is nothing. You're not descending on your wife, on your husband, as if this and that, I will crush you. You will know that I am so and so. You cannot do anything for God that will be acceptable, but it is when you're free, when your life is free, and when everything you have, you bring, and you're unfettered. Your life is straightforward. Your life is free. And your life is based on that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It is only then that you will be able to have everything the Lord himself has called you to do. You will do it in Jesus' name. Because the Lord had said, verily, assuredly, I say unto you, whatsoever, whatsoever, may be a demon, 
whatsoever may be sickness, whatsoever may be something that had looked impossible before, whatsoever he shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And it says, whatsoever he shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Give me a good, good day. Amen. In Matthew chapter 16, I'm reading here from verse 19. Matthew chapter 16, we're looking at verse 19. It says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. It is when you have become a child in the kingdom a member of the kingdom and you are a standing member a standing member in the kingdom that all the things in the kingdom of darkness all that is washed away in your heart all the things in the occultic kingdom all that is not there all the things in the evil kingdom of satan all that is not there in your life and you are free from all those characteristics of the kingdom of darkness it's only then he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever, somebody help me shout, whatsoever. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'm sure you've heard that verse before. I'm sure you have tried to also operate on that verse before. The question is why? Are we binding on earth? And it's not being bound in heaven because of the things that bind us, the iniquity that binds us, the transgression that binds us because of the bad habit, the bad behavior that binds us. And then we come when the time of ministry rises up and then we're called unto bind. The key does not work. Sometimes you have the key in your hand. You put it in there. The door will not open. The stiffness there. There is corroding there. And because of that, that key will not work. But when your life is free, when your life is unfettered, when your life is totally yielded unto the Lord in holiness and righteousness without fear, all the days of your life, then the key will work in you your hand. The key will work in your mouth when there is holiness that not even Satan can contradict in your life. That holiness makes the key to work. And you say whatsoever thou shalt bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. Look at Job chapter 22. And I'm reading there from verse 21. Job chapter 22. Reading from verse 21. Acquaint now thyself with him. And be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Look at verse 22. In verse 22 it says, Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. And let of his words in thine heart. Verse 23, it says, If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. That's how the key of authority works. That's how the key of power works. That there is no iniquity. You put iniquity private iniquity, personal iniquity, perpetual iniquity, all the things you normally do that God counts as iniquity, you put that far away from thy tabernacle. Then it says in verse 28, in verse 28, it says, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. Yeah. No sin, no iniquity, no transgression, no anger, no bitterness, 
no hatred, and no compromise when you stand as a real child of God, man of God, woman of God, and every form of iniquity had been taken far away from you. Then it says, thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and by light, thy light, my light, my light, and thy light shall shine upon, it shall shine upon thy ways. We're looking at number two there. Number two there is the boundless possibilities of united brethren. United, brethren, they're united in their heart, not only in their mouth. They're united in the teaching of the Word of God. They're united in transparent living. They're united, whatever they say behind is what they say when they see us. Whatever they plant behind, that's what they plan when they see us. They're united, united in Christ united in righteousness, the united in holiness, the united in faith, the united in the love of God. It says the boundless possibilities of united brethren. It tells us in Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 19, it says, again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven amen, amen. Yeah. if two of you shall agree not only agreeing on this point of prayer agree with me agree with me well before i agree with you to pray and to subdue and to move that mountain. Are we in agreement in our understanding of who Christ is? Are we in agreement in the character of the believer? Are we in agreement in our personal, private action? What we do is when we truly agree, the Lord is not looking for union, you know, we're all together, physically, naturally, in society. It's looking for a heart that is fully committed to what he has ordained. And because of that, if we're united in that way, then if two of us, not James and John, against the other ten, we want to be up there, and you want to be want the rest to be lower there. Now James and John they agreed as touching this thing they are asking. It wasn't done. The unity is not only I'm asking for the throne, I'm asking for position, I'm asking for power, I'm asking for possibilities, I'm asking for the spectacular. The unity of heart between James and John and the rest of them. When the ten heard, they were filled with indignation. Well, that's not unity. He wants us to abandon. He wants us to clear up all those indignations and all the iniquity. And when we're united in heart, united in humility, and we're united in holiness, the two of us shall agree as touching anything, then it will be done for us of our Father who's in heaven. Look at verse 20. In verse 20 it says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, and whatever we cannot do in his name, we don't practice that, we don't do that, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Look at number three here. Number three, it tells us here, it says, the benevolent pilgrim with unlimited brotherliness, unlimited brotherliness. It tells us in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft 
shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him. Okay, Peter, don't give an answer. You already asked the Lord how often, how much, how many times will my brother sin against me and I forgive him. Let the Lord answer. Many times when we ask questions, we have our own preconceived ideas as to what the answer ought to be. You come to the Lord, you're asking a question. When you finish your question, stop there. Don't ask. Look at this. Till seven times. And Peter thought he had arrived because, uh, you know, the, those uh, people of the Jewish race, they'll say, when somebody offends you once, count. Second time, count. Third time, count. And tell him, final. You do anything beyond that third time, no more. And so Peter thought, I'm going to go beyond those natural people, those Jewish people. And so he went a little bit ahead and he doubled it and added one. He said, till seven times. And now hear the answer of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 22. In verse 22, Jesus says unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times. How is it, Peter? You're repeating what Christ has never said unto you. How is it, my brother? You are acting and you're behaving and you're saying what Christ has never commanded. And, and you think you're doing well because you've gone beyond three times now until seven times listen to the lord when we listen to the lord our way will be straight towards heaven when we listen to the lord all the pebbles and all the stumbling stones will be taken away from our life and from the direction in which we are living and jesus said but until 70 times seven what does that mean for a for b for c for your husband, for your wife, for your child, for your parent, for your office workers, co-workers, for everyone you relate with in life. If you want to open a notebook, one to 490, you will not have any other thing to do in life. A is soon as number 11. B, her own, is number 17. And C, his own, is number 4. And you go through that with everybody on earth you relate with, and you are waiting until it will reach 490. 70 times 7. That makes you to understand now what Christ had in mind. He just says, just forgive. Just forgive. You're going to heaven, just forgive. You meet this bottleneck, just forgive. You come across this crossroad, just forgive. You hear what they're saying, just forgive. You feel the pain of what they're doing, just forgive. And I say not unto you. This requires genuine salvation. If somebody is not saved, no way, no way. Even to forgive three times, to forgive seven times, if somebody is not really born again from heaven, if somebody does not have the nature of Christ, if somebody does not have the very mind of Christ, this is literally impossible. He's saying, get born again, have the nature of God, have the mind of Christ, and have that heavenly eraser and melting in your heart that whatever people do, whatever people say, however people act, forgive, 
forgive, forgive. You don't like, you cannot like everything everybody does in the world. It's not about liking those things. It's not about approving of those things. You don't like them. You don't approve of them. All the same until 70 times 7. Keep on forgiving. The Lord give us grace in Jesus' name. Uh, give us the grace. He will not fail. And he will act mightily in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Yeah. We'll come to point number three now. Point number three. For feature of precious opportunities through bitterness. For feature of precious opportunities through bitterness. Already you know the story. This man owed his lord a large amount of money that he could not pay for a whole lifetime. And then the lord, his master, forgave him. Then he saw another servant lower than himself, owing him Peter's little amount of money and he said pay that that you owe me and the servant said please just like he said to his lord and master have patience with me i will pay the patience no now now pay me and the fellow could not have the wherewithal to pay him and he threw him into the prison and the neighbors and the friends and other people had his colleagues and they said this is not right you were forgiven that large amount and you couldn't forgive this person and he didn't say will not pay you and you threw him into the prison and they reported to his lord and the lord said the wicked the cruel servant i forgave thee all that and then he took away the forgiveness he had given him you have a hard heart you have a stony heart you have an unbending will and because of that the forgiveness i gave you before that is now cancelled he forfeited the precious opportunity of being at one with the Lord, with the master, with the master of the whole universe, with the Lord of the whole universe, because he will not forgive. We, the Lord told us the story for ourselves. He didn't tell us the story only to teach. He didn't tell me that story so that I, come, I can come here and teach. He gave me the story that I will practice it. He gave you the story. He gave you the parable that this is what God will do. He didn't give you the story or that parable so that you will add to your knowledge. You can even memorize it and recite it for memory. Not for that. That you will take care. That yes, you are saved. You are forgiven. Yes, you are a member of the family of God, you are forgiven. Yes, you have relationship and favor from God, you are forgiven. That forgiveness that the Lord has given you, the stage of that forgiveness and the measure of that forgiveness, he wants you to carry that out and look at this uh, audience and say, really, really, I have uh, something against that brother. And it's been churning in my mind, turning in my mind. And I cannot continue. Continue preaching. Continue serving. Continue doing this and that. When I have that hatred, that bitterness, that anger in my heart, I have to settle this. That's the reason why. He gave us the story, not just to be smiling and laughing with each other. You know, it's coming. <laughs> As a man again, let me laugh. Anybody can put on a laughter. Let me smile. Anybody can put on a plastic smile. Settle and forgive them from the depths of your heart. Look at 
chapter 18 of Matthew. I'm reading from verse 35. 18, verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. When I talk angrily, that shows there is something in my heart I'm not forgiving. When I say we're parting ways, go your way, I go my way, there is something in the heart you have not forgiven. When you say never, I cannot live with this woman anymore. Well, if I don't marry another, we'll separate. There is something that's an offense you have not, you don't want to forgive. When you say, I want to make the separation legal, and I'm going to go there, write a bill of divorcement, and push her away, don't come to my house anymore. Don't visit the children in the school anymore. When you come to that point, there is something you cannot forgive only for 10 more years on earth, 30 more years on earth. Think about heaven. If you don't forgive, if you don't reconcile here on earth, you're separated from God. God forever and ever in eternity. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother, everyone his wife, everyone her husband, everyone his sister, everyone his neighbor. So shall my heavenly father do unto you if you don't forgive everyone the brother their trespasses three things we're looking at number one the fate of unmerciful oppressors under tormentors they also come to torment themselves number two is the future of unrepentant offenders in torments number three the fullness unwavering obedience and teachableness number one number one is the fate of unmerciful oppressors under tormentors look at Matthew chapter 18 verse 32 chapter 18 verse 32 then his Lord after that he had called him said unto him O the wicked servant I forgive thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Then in verse 33, shouldest thou not also have had compassion, compassion, mercy, love, tenderness. As you deal with other people, relate with other people, <laughs> there are people, they just want the work done. And because all they think about is to get the work done. They can be cruel. They can be pushful. They can be wicked. They can be bossy. Because I want the work done. Go beyond the work. You want to get to heaven. If this work is done to your satisfaction, but you miss heaven that the doors are only open to the compassionate and the merciful and the loving and the meek and the gentle but all those characters you have lost because you are running after success success the work must be done anywhere i am everything must be perfect you're looking at a perfect work but you're not looking at you're being able to get to heaven it says shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as 
even as you could not pay, I forgive you. Even as you pleaded and I forgive you, even as I act pity on thee. And then in verse 34, it says, and his Lord was wrath. He also was angry. Watch, you demonstrate to other people. That's what the Lord will demonstrate to you. To the merciful, he, God, will be merciful. To the fraud, to the cruel, and to the bossy, he also will be cruel. He also will make you pay what you need to pay, and you cannot pay that for a lifetime. He was wrong, and then his Lord was wrong, and delivered him to the tormentors. He delivered that other servant to the tormentors. He, he exposed him to the people outside that would deal with him with tormenting power. And so what he did to that servant, and he didn't have compassion the Lord did to him till he shall pay all that was due unto him and the Lord then gives us the conclusion in verse 35 and he says so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you you who is that Peter was standing in front of him. Apostle. James, John was standing. The disciples were before him. And when he said you, he met the people that claimed relationship with him. And he said, if you don't forgive James and John wanting that position and you allow the smoke of that indignation to go on and on, so shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye forgive, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. I pray God will give us grace Amen. that this forgiveness Christ has spoken about very clearly will manifest it out of the grace of God in our hearts in Jesus name. Amen. Look at number two there. Number two the future of unrepentant offenders in torments. The future of unrepentant offenders in torments. In Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. It must needs be that offenses come. It must needs be that offenses come. That's what we we'll forget in life. In life, we we'll think everything will be rosy. Everything will be smooth. Everything will be plain. And because we thought everything will be plain and smooth, we're not ready when the bombs come. We're not ready when the potholes, uh, you know, come under the tire of our car. Because we thought everything will be all right. We expected everyone that relates with us to be a perfect angel. And that there will be no offense at all. And when those offenses come, we're not ready. But if you understand that Jesus said, it must needs be that offenses come when they come you'll not be surprised when they come you'll not be jolted when they come you'll not be offended when they come you'll not lose your head you'll not lose your mind it will come and the, but it says but woe to that man living with god leave her with god don't fight don't argue don't tear anything apart don't tremble with anger it's in the hand of God, but woe unto that man by whom the offenses come. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, 
offend thee to the point it's going to take heaven away from you that as you are concentrating on his action her action every time instead of thinking about the promises of god you're thinking about the problem with him about the problem with her instead of making progress according to your consecration the whole thing is setting you back instead of laying everything upon the altar lord anger i lay it on the altar bitterness i lay it on the altar compromise i lay it on the altar and instead of concentrating on what you have laid on the altar this man this woman will divert your attention every time from the way and the road to heaven oh it says don't hate him don't fight him but don't allow him don't allow her to be a stumbling block on your way to heaven i pray god will give you wisdom David forgave Saul, but he didn't go to a park, all his property, and go and live in the house of Saul. He was wiser than that. Moses forgave Pharaoh, but Pharaoh said, you'll not see my face again. The day you see my face, you will die. And Moses did not park his family and then go and live in the boys' quarter of Pharaoh. And Jesus forgave the Pharisees, but he didn't, uh, you know, invite them uh, when he was going to talk, sanctification stuff to his own disciples. No, we must be wise. The people that will trip you and the people that will make you to fall and the people that will make you to lose heaven, you will know how to put enough gap between you and them. Uh, Nobody will take heaven away from your hand. It says, wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them up and cast them from thee. For it is better for thee to enter into life, halt, or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet and be cast or be cast into everlasting fire anything that will make you end in everlasting fire you separate from everyone in jesus name yeah. look at number three here number three is the fullness of unwavering obedience and teachableness the fullness of unwavering unwavering obedience and teachableness the grace to be obedient the lord give everyone Amen. and the grace to be teachable the lord give unto everyone Amen. and when in little things and in big things in the area of loyalty in the area of love in the area of faithfulness, in the area of forgiveness, in the area of compassion, in the area of consecration, when you are faithful to the Lord, great will be what the Lord will do in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 19. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, to know it experientially, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen? Amen. Filled with all the fullness of God. Now, think about it this way. Since I've been hearing the word of God as I became born again, think of it like a bowl of water. And every time you hear some water, clean water is poured into that bowl, poured into that bowl. By now, that bowl should be full. But you know, anger punches hole there. Bitterness punches another hole there. Compromise brings another hole 
there and because of all the holes that all those things have been punching in that bowl as we're pouring in water the thing is leaking and so you don't have the fullness but now if you repair that bowl that heart and all the anger is gone all the bitterness is gone and all the compromise everything gone and all the argument and the conflict everything gone and now there's love and there is faith and there is forgiveness and nothing is leaking anymore in your heart in your bowl your bowl will be full yeah. that's why it says to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God and then in verse 20 it says now unto him that is able to do abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us verse 21 it says to him the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end Amen in your life. Amen. Amen in your family. Amen, Amen in your ministry. Amen. No more anger. Amen. No more bitterness. Amen. No more cruelty. Amen. No more unforgiving spirit. Amen. And the fullness of grace. And the fullness of his love and the fullness of his power and the fullness of possibilities will shower upon your life in Jesus name let's rise up now and talk to the Lord you talk to the Lord from your heart not a make-believe prayer not how rich prayer you talk to the Lord by everything you have heard that everything will be reproduced in your life.